First, welcome and thank you all so much for joining. We're really excited to share all the details around um, what we've been building as well as the dates and how you can connect to um, the beta version of our test net. Um, you're gonna get to meet all, all the team members um, so that you can put a face with a name and they'll introduce themselves kind of as they go through their areas. Um, so I'll start, I'm Claire and I lead marketing and community here um, at O of One Labs. Um, we have a whole great team that's behind all of this hard work. Um, this isn't all of us, but this is most of us. And uh, we're really excited to work more with you over the coming months to really get the beta test net off the ground. And we're here to make this a really good experience for you however we can. So um, there's lots of different, there's lots of different um, ways that we'll all be kind of interacting. We'll all be on the Discord, which we'll share with you how to join. So um, yeah, we're happy to meet you and hope to hope to get to know you a little bit better over the coming months. Um, so now I'm gonna kick it over to Evan, who's one of our founders and our CEO, and he is gonna take you through um, Coda and, and just really why we're so excited about it. Hey guys, Evan over here. Yeah, excited to be talking to you guys and looking forward to telling you a little bit about Coda and uh, why we think it's like pretty cool. Um, so if we think about cryptocurrency today, there's like uh, some obstacles, I guess, getting in the way of making them easy to use, easy to access, easy to like start using. Um, and it really comes down to um, the, when you want to access a cryptocurrency, the first thing you have to do is you have to download the blockchain. And downloading the blockchain today is like a pretty significant effort. Downloading the blockchain is like, at some cases, hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes. And if you want to use a cryptocurrency trustlessly, that's what you have to do. And that creates a lot of challenges today. If you're like a node operator, you have to download like a full node, which is like a lot of data to download, takes a really long time. If you're a user, you can't access cryptocurrency trustlessly, you have to access it through a third party. And if you're a developer, you have to learn about a huge surface area of different kind of mitigations to like this blockchain like access issue that none of which are really perfect and adds a lot of complexity to getting going with cryptocurrency. And fundamentally, like, it means that cryptocurrencies kind of are, like, victims of their own success in a way. Like, the more use that cryptocurrency has, the bigger its blockchain gets, the harder it is to directly access the cryptocurrency, the slower it can grow. It really limits, like, how easy it is to get access to cryptocurrency and use cryptocurrency. And I think we all want to grow the ecosystem here, but, like, we have to solve this core technical issue if it's going to happen. Um, and that's where... Uh, thanks, Claire. Uh, Coda comes in. So Coda is our solution to this issue. We replace the blockchain with a constant size zero knowledge proof. And that proof stands in exactly for this whole blockchain. And that proof can be updated efficiently through recursive zero knowledge proofs. So now instead of having this huge blockchain that grows with every transaction, we have this single little proof that's only a few kilobytes and stays that size no matter how much usage the cryptocurrency is getting, no matter how, what the throughput is, it's sustainable and scalable. And that lets Coda take some steps towards like what we want from cryptocurrency, towards like a user-owned, universally accessible way of doing digital finance. Um, if we look into how that matters today, uh, it means that with Coda, you'll be able to access it trustlessly from any device, from anywhere in the world. You won't have to go through any third parties. And that means that you don't have to think about like what is the incentive of this third party? Like, are they going to have downtime? Are they really going to be accountable? Can you trust them with all of your data? You can just access it directly from your device, which is awesome. Another thing it means is that if you're a developer, you can just kind of access Coda from like any device with like the same interface. You don't have to learn like these partial solutions for different platforms, for different user groups. The library acts as a full node and like everyone can just use that full node library if you're a developer really easily on any platform. And then lastly, as I was mentioning, like it's actually sustainable and scalable. Like um, as the blockchain grows, as there's more transactions, the cryptocurrency is still just as easy to verify as it was on day one. And we can put a lot of transactions through the system and it still stays scalable and sustainable, which is great. Um, so yeah, now I'll pass it off to Izzy. He'll talk more about some of like the core technical improvements. Izzy's our, one of my co-founder and also our CTO. Hey, um, just trying to talk into the mic. So thank you too for being started. And thank you, Claire, for organizing. Um, I just wanted to kind of highlight a, a few of the interesting technical components of, of Coda um, and like the technology that, that makes what Evan's talking about possible. Um, 
So the first one is what are what's called recursive snarks, recursive ZK snarks, maybe. Um, and uh, basically, this is like a, a really kind of amazing cryptographic technology, uh, which works in the following way. So maybe some people watching know about ZK snarks. I, probably a lot of you do. Um, uh, if you don't, they're, uh, they're a way that you can certify like the result of any computation with like a really little and easy to verify proof. Um, but uh, ZK snarks themselves have this drawback, which is that they only function on um, sort of fixed size computations um, that you need to sort of in advance say, yeah, like this is how long my computation is going to be. Um, in a blockchain, this is not obviously the setting of a blockchain where you have this this computation of like checking the blockchain, which which gets longer and longer. It's like arbitrarily long. Um, and recursive snarks are a technique that basically lets you uh, use snarks to certify computations that you don't know how long they're going to be ahead of time um, in an efficient way. So uh, the way it works is basically you, you start up with a snark, a little proof which says, hey, yeah, I saw a blockchain uh, that was a thousand blocks long. And then you can come along and make a snark that says, I saw a snark, which says, I saw a blockchain which was a thousand blocks long. And I saw one block uh, which updates the blockchain to get a blockchain that's like a thousand and one blocks long. So um, in this way, you can sort of update the, the last snark while, uh, uh, to get a new snark that sort of stands in for like the new 1001 block blockchain. Um, so that's recursive snarks. It's really amazing cryptographic technology. It's, uh, you know, lets you certify general computation with these tiny proofs. Um, uh, yeah, and if you're interested in learning more and getting your hands dirty with, with that and other kind of snark techniques, this is a great place to be. Um, uh, the second thing I want to highlight is our um, consensus mechanism. So I called it here Code of Boros. I hope I don't offend anyone with this name choice because I didn't uh, discuss with anyone. But um, uh, basically, this is uh, Coda's version of the Ouroboros proof of stake protocol. Um, and just to highlight a few of the important aspects of it, um, it's tailored to work in this setting of a constant size blockchain, uh, which is distinct from other proof of stake protocols. Um, it's also permissionless, and there's no threshold for participation. So um, anyone can participate. Uh, it's distinct in that regard from, you know, delegated proof of stake protocols such as in EOS, um, and it's more similar to, to something like Tezos or uh, maybe the like the proof of work mechanisms that are in Bitcoin, Zcash, Ethereum, etc. Um, except that uh, it's proof of stake, so it's much more energy efficient, um, and uh, you know, well, depending on who asks, maybe has better security. I, I, depends on who you ask. I won't make any claims. Okay. Um, and then the third thing, which is sort of like a synthesis, I, I guess, of these two things, is this fact that we can have these tiny, su sort of super resource efficient full nodes, um, which which makes it possible for anyone to connect uh, instantly to Coda while retaining like complete security, um, uh, and uh, you know having like a, a really frictionless uh, interface and experience there. So uh, that's a bit about the technology. If you're interested in, in learning about snarks and learning about programming snarks, um, I think uh, getting involved with our testnet is a great opportunity to, to do that, um, as well as if you're interested in learning more about proof of stake and how to make that work in a succinct setting, which pr presents like a unique set of challenges. I, I also just want to call out now uh, the, the, the three roles that exist in Coda um, and the three roles that people who are involved in the testnet will be uh, I don't know, what's the verb? Acting out, I guess. That kind of sounds weird, but the roles that people will be taking on. Um, and uh, the first one is, is that of a staker. So those are the people who are the nodes, I should say, who are actually participating in the consensus mechanism, um, proposing blocks, creating, creating new blocks. Um, as I mentioned, it's permissionless. Uh, anyone, anyone can get involved. Um, it's it's relative. It's it's sort of distinct from uh, other proof of stake protocols, like maybe something like Cosmos, where you ha need to have like 100% uptime. Um, here, you know, your 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 uptime is sort of proportional to your stake, or like your the uptime that you should maintain is sort of proportional to your stake, and, and you know when you need to be up. But um, uh, yeah, uh, that's all I'll say about that. Um, snarkers. So okay, right. So I mentioned. Uh, you know, or we, we talked about we have this constant size blockchain, whatever, it involves snarks somehow, these zero knowledge proofs. Um, but uh, these 
journal proofs, they don't, they don't make themselves, so to speak. <laughs> um, so, so someone has, has to actually make them. Um, and uh, star markers are, are the nodes in our system that are actually producing the, the zero-knowledge proofs. Um, and uh, that's done through this kind of distributed, um, decentralized, and incentivized uh, kind of market, or snarket, if you like, um, in which any nodes on the network can produce these proofs, um, which are, like, in effect, compressing the blockchain. Um, and receive a, a fee for that work. So um, right now, that will mostly be done uh, using like CPUs. Um, but we are, have been running this Snark challenge, which is uh, uh, wrapping up soon. Um, and we we uh, got as a submission a much much faster GPU prover. Um, and so once that gets integrated, or maybe someone uh, wants to help help us integrate it. Um, that will uh, open up the door to like much more efficient snarkers um, on GPU, and in the future maybe even other hardware. Um, so the third role that I'll call out is is verifier. So those are the end nodes that are that are uh, interacting actually with the constant size blockchain. They're not participating in consensus, but they are, um, you know, interacting with the blockchain, checking it, um, sending transactions, and and all that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of all I, I want to talk about. Uh, these are the, the three kind of te technological roles or protocol level roles um, within Coda. And uh, I hope, you know, many of you will participate in one of these roles. Um, and yeah. Great. Um, next, Brad is going to take us through um, a little bit about the philosophy of the testnet as well as um, some other of the details. Sure. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, you guys might have heard we're going to run a testnet pretty soon. Um, uh, when we were first like planning and thinking about this testnet, we sort of thought about like two types of philosophical approaches we could have to the testnet. Um, one is kind of the more like uh, Libra style, I guess, <laughs> philosophy where you know we try and find the biggest, baddest corporations we could, the people with the most resources, and we come into like a little cartel. We try and make sure that everyone is. <laughs> you know, highly incentivized um, and uh, highly available to, you know, basically join. We, we gate these submissions and then we choose, choose the best. Um, and then the other one is maybe a little bit more in line with other testnets we've seen like Cosmos, like Bitcoin testnet, where we just sort of like casually reach out to a lot of people, um, say if you want to be involved, like we are uh, welcome and very inviting um, to anyone who's interested in participating. Um, and, and we really chose sort of like the, the latter. So, um, you know, basically what we're hoping to do is um, find anyone who's interested in helping out in really any way. And there's like lots of different ways you can be involved and um, not really spending too much time uh, focusing on making uh, every part of it as perfect or as polished as we possibly can. Because, you know, we really think that the way the community is going to develop and grow is by like taking this challenge together and um, basically seeing what we, we can make. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really heartened by the response we've had so far. We've talked to some amazing people in this community. I was like sort of stunned at the level of expertise you all have shown and, and people who have reached out to us. So um, I'm really excited to just sort of open up the floodgates and start empowering, um, you know, people with um, roles and tasks and um, ways they want to contribute to the protocol. So um, I guess I can jump into that. Um, yeah, so these are some of the people who um, we've been chatting with and some of the people we've been seeing in the community. Um, first thing is, you know, we are at really um, the early stages of a cryptocurrency protocol. We've, we've been spending a year and a half um, and even longer, like, coming up with these ideas and building out the technology. Um, but, uh, you know, we, <laughs> it's still, we have quite a ways to go before we have, you know, a sufficiently advanced community that we can call ourselves like a real cryptocurrency. So we're in really like the early stages of that. Um, and that means that things are going to be messy. So like Snarks right now, they're developing at an incredibly rapid pace. I mean, you can just like, as a casual observer, you can see like, um, all of these papers coming out, um, like new systems, the technology that's really like the basis of our system. A lot of it was developed like in 2014, 2016. Um, and even, you know, in the last couple of months, we've been sped up Snarks 3x from the, the baseline from the steady. I mean, I think the Snark that we are using now is from 2018. Yeah, so we're using Snark from 2018, 2019. Yeah. Um, they're going to keep on evolving really quickly. And we're also seeing Snarks being adopted all throughout the like cryptocurrency ecosystem. So, um, you know, 
you know, it's, it seems like every day there's like a new protocol is like, oh yeah, we're gonna use Snarks basically to solve a similar problem. So it's, I think it's really exciting to be sort of in the center of um, where it feels like a lot of the energy is going in the crypto in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And so we're like super enthusiastic about uh, finding people who are interested in this technology and seeing if we can push the boundaries. Um, and then the third thing is sort of like, you know, I think we all recognize that we're part of a broader movement than just sort of one protocol. We're trying to push back against, um, you know, these these trends we see in our economic and technological system where there's increasing, um, you know, disempowerment of individuals and communities and increasing um, monopoly power. And um, I think we want to, you know, we, we know that building a counter movement to that, you know, it, on one hand, it requires a lot of technological process, but on the other hand, it requires a lot of people who are aligned in a community um, who realize that it's going to be a long um, and I think really interesting project to build out these alternative spaces and systems. So, you know, people who are interested in joining that effort. Um, yeah, you go on to the next slide. Oh yeah, so uh, here are the goals for the testnet. Um, first thing is, you know, basically talking with everyone in the community and trying to figure out how people want to be involved and then elevating those people to um, positions where they can really start having a big impact on the cryptocurrency where they can sort of grow and develop their own skills and contribute to this like burgeoning ecosystem. Um, the second thing is developing a protocol and a community that can run that protocol to standards that we would feel comfortable releasing as a mainnet. And so that's, we have like a, a big list of metrics that we'll be hitting and I'll talk in a little bit um, about how we're planning on targeting those metrics. And then the third thing, of course, is uh, having a good time because, uh, you know, why, why would you do anything if it's not very fun? So um, if you're, we're like really excited about the technology and we've been having a really good time building it out and we're really excited to meet you all and, and incorporate you into the process too. And uh, yeah, so um, this is a little bit sort of, we've gotten, we got a lot of questions about this on different calls that we had. Like, I think people, there's a lot of activity right now um, in the cryptocurrency ecosystem and a lot of new protocols coming to market. So, um, you know, we've had questions about, okay, well, why should I, you know, focus on Coda um, as opposed to another protocol? And so we wanted to talk a little bit about how we're planning on, you know, basically giving recognition and, and um, incentives to people who are joining uh, our testnet. So, uh, you know, we've developed this concept of testnet points. Um, and uh, I don't know how many people are from, this might be like a, you know, more American centric <laughs> reference, but I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, TV show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, anyway, so we, we developed testnet points and basically they are not going to be um, redeemable in any way for like Coda cryptocurrency and they have no monetary value. Um, they're not transferable um, and are, uh, we, you know, the, there's an asterisk at the bottom that say exactly what they are <laughs> that our lawyer told us to put in. So I'm sticking very closely to that script. <laughs> um, but, you know, we wanted to incorpor incorporate them because it's really important to us for the community to be able to suss out the relative strengths of different people who are participating in the network. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be marching towards a mainnet candidate and in that process, we're gonna be laser focused on, you know, each week, one or two metrics that we're really trying to push forward. So maybe what we care about one week is availability. Um, and the next week, what we care about is throughput. Um, we're going to be trying to incentivize certain behaviors and really like challenge people in the community to push the, um, push the performance and test the performance of the network at large. And we wanna reward and recognize people who are able to do that really effectively. So we're going to be issuing these weekly challenges. We're going to have a leaderboard tracking people's contributions and performance. And then we're going to be issuing these points which can sort of like serve as a general um, way that the community is coming to consensus and understanding um, you know, which uh, participants are able to do what and what their relative strengths are. So. Um, it's definitely something we're going to be tracking and um, paying attention to, and I think it's going to be really fun, um, coming back to the earlier point, um, to, to watch how it evolves. And, um, but it's, you know, it's not, we're not making any legal guarantees here, um, so uh, if there's any SEC agents on the call, just you know, letting you know. Um, <laughs> we're following the laws. <laughs> okay, and then I believe I'm passing it off to Brandon. Hi, uh, I'm Brandon. Uh, I've been doing engineering stuff for a really long time on Coda. Um, currently, I'm doing a bunch of product-related engineering stuff. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 
the requirements for joining the, the testnet beta. Um, so uh, one, we've tried to keep these as low as possible because we want to be inclusive to everyone and everyone should be able to join and, and participate. Um, if you actually want to run the software uh, right now, um, you need uh, either Mac OS or uh, and a recent one will work. We've tested on like the one before the, the current beta, the current stable one. Um, on, on Linux, if you have Debian 9 or Ubuntu 18.04, uh, we have like very detailed documentation. We have apt get uh, repos, but I, I don't know the right term for it, but it, it's, all, it's all solid, it's all smooth. Um, if you want to join from a different Linux distribution or from some weird version of Mac OS, you can build from source and, and that should work and we'll be able to help out uh, in, in Discord, but, uh, you know, but we can't guarantee anything for, for those um, in, in the short term. Uh, for, for hardware, um, to, to send and receive Coda, you don't need any special hardware above just, you know, one of those, something running those two operating systems I mentioned above. Um, oh, I, I should say, we will support Windows. We we want to support Windows. We know it's important. It's, we, we just haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe you all can help us. Uh, <laughs> all right, so so I, I, besides the operating system, um, you, you don't need anything special uh, to, to actually send and receive Coda to join the network. In order to um, be what we call a node operator, that is one of these snarkers or uh, or stakers, um, you need a decent decent specs, like a, a four core processor that's sort of recent and about eight gigs of RAM. Um, in the future, you're going to need uh, GPUs likely, but um, a, a, as we said before, because we're gonna be sort of in, improving the, the performance and at a certain point, CPUs are just gonna not be able to, to, to do the work, but, but at least for now, you won't. Um, for, for network requirements, if you have at least a one megabit per second connection up and down, uh, you, you should be able to connect and join and, and, and do things. Um, if you have 10 megabits per second, uh, life might be better because there's an initial download for now that is a little bit large. Um, as we said, like we want a, a uh, and we know it's possible and we will do it, have this really, really small node that, that can verify. But right now we, we just are packaging sort of everything in one, one application, the, the thing that can stake, uh, snark, uh, verify it and, and, and that. So, so there's, there's like a, a, a step, uh, you know, a, a couple gigabyte download that you have to do in the beginning um, for now. But I swear it's gonna, it's, it's gonna get better. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's about it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Pranay, who's going to talk about the docs. Thanks, Brandon. Hi, everybody. This is Pranay. I'm doing developer relations at Coda. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the documentation and support that will be available when the testnet goes live. Uh, the docs will be hosted at codaprotocol.org slash docs. Uh, it's not live yet. If you go there now, you'll see a beautiful Firebase 404 page. So. Uh, uh, .org and .com both work. Uh, they'll redirect to the same place. So um, that's where the docs will live. And the docs will contain basically two, two parts. The first part from overview to become a node operator is sort of like a quick start walkthrough to uh, get the uh, executable installed, like Brandon was saying, and uh, a walkthrough to send your first Coda transaction and participate in the network. So this will be very plug and play, easy to do, and you'll be able to follow the docs, get this done. Uh, the second part is more for advanced users, kind of developer documentation. And I just want to note that this will be in flux when we release it. So this will evolve over time as we get feedback from the community on what the uh, API should look like, what y'all want in the CLI. So this will be kind of something that we'd love to work with the community to build out and harden over time. And as part of that, um, feel free to add any issues and submit PRs on GitHub. Everything is open source, so if you want to jump into the code, you can do so right away. Uh, everything is available, and you can jump into Discord as well. Uh, the Coda community is very active on Discord, and we're always around to help and troubleshoot. So if you're having any issues with the documentation and need any help setting up, feel free to jump on there and uh, get in touch. We'll, we'll help. Um, so let me pass it on to Joel, who will talk a little bit more about support and office hours. Yeah, hi, my name is Joel Krauska. I uh, am one of the SREs uh, here at uh, Coda. And uh, if you see our slide, if you see a, 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 a Unicode skull uh, as output <laughs> from our daemon, that's actually a good thing. It means that our daemons crash and we, we'd like to know why. Um, and it'll say that as much and then give you a link. Uh, so what we'd like people to do when they're involved in the testnet is we're gonna have problems. We're gonna uh, find crashes and that's, that's a good thing because it makes it better for everyone. 
Um, and you'll be able to submit those via GitHub issues, or you can send an email to support at onlabs.org, um, or also just work with us live on the Discord channel and say, here's what I'm seeing, this is not working, can you help me out? And we're there to help you. Um, I am saying that our hours are nine to five, uh, Monday through Friday. That's our, our goal, that's our office hours. Uh, but really, we're online a lot more than that. And uh, we're hoping over time, people uh, can learn to help each other out here. I think a lot of you are gonna have some of the same problems uh, bootstrapping and getting started. And we're hoping that everybody can work together to, to pull this up. Um, so that's all I have. Uh, look for me, Jay Kraska on Discord if you uh, get stuck on our early uh, turnups and uh, look forward to having you join. Awesome. Um, so in terms of where you can go to find out all of this information, um, first, as Pranay mentioned, uh, we'll have the documentation up soon. And so that'll be really be like your single source of truth um, for all of the technical documentation. Um, and that'll be uh, live and we welcome all of your suggestions about how we can continue to improve it. Um, we'll also be issuing blogs on Medium, which will kind of explore like different um, ideas or progress that we've made. And so that's kind of a more experimental area where we won't have, you know, technical documentation, but we'll be thinking through like, how's it going and what are some of the applications of this? Um, if any of you love writing or blogging, you know, we'll also feature um, guest members of our community. So reach out to me if that's interesting to you. Um, we'll be producing YouTube videos, which will also kind of talk through some of the progress and developments and you'll get to know um, all of these people in the room and more a little bit better. Um, we'll also have a discourse which we're setting up, so that'll be coming soon. Um, and we have our Discord. Um, the link below is uh, an invitation for you. Um, we'll also be sending this out through um, email and, and sharing it through our channels a little bit later. So for now, um, the Discord channel is really where you need to go um, if you want to start getting involved. And that'll be very actively updated with all the information. So um, our big announcement is that we will be launching our public testnet beta on the 24th, which is next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, that's when you'll be able to start connecting um, and you'll be able to start playing around in the documentation. So for now, if you're excited by that, please uh, go over to the Discord channel and um, join and just get to know the team and um, wait for more announcements to come through the week and on Wednesday. Yeah, so that's, that's the exciting announcement. Um, what we wanna do now is take a little community Q&A. So if you could chat in your questions um, and then we can kind of pick some of the most relevant ones and answer them. We have about 10 minutes left on the call, um, but I think like we're happy to go a little bit over if it requires. Um, so yeah, let us know what questions you have and thank you again for joining. We had about 600 people express interest in the public test public test net beta through various um, channels through the form that you all filled out and have just been so overwhelmed by like the quality and the interest of, of different people um, and we can't wait to meet you more. And can I, can I just say thank you to everyone who made slides and thank you to Pravaja for designing these beautiful slides. Yes, for sure. <laughs> this is a big team effort. Um, all right, great. So can somebody pull up the, um, the chat? Nothing there. Okay, um, so we don't have any, oh, okay. okay. Great, so we have our first question. Go ahead and chat in your questions and we'll um, kind of take a look at them and address the ones that are most relevant. And then of course, you know how to reach us on Discord. So if you have some questions that don't get answered or maybe it's a longer conversation, um, Discord is the best place to go. Yep. Okay, so give me one second to pull these up. Um, okay, perfect. So Pablo asked, uh, how many, how will nodes be incentivized yeah. and um, any EOS MN type models? Who wants to take this question? I can, I can do the first time. Yeah, okay, so, um, right. So we're using a code of Boros as, uh, as mentioned. And basically the way that works is um, there's block rewards in every block. So if you are a staker then you can, you, and it's your slot, then you can um, claim the reward. Um, that's one way. So the other way is there's going to be fees. So um, you know if there's a transaction as a fee, you'll also gain that fee if you're a staker. And then the third thing, which is I think unique to Coda as a cryptocurrency, is we have this market place. So you can basically constantly perform useful work for the network 
um, that is produce snarks, and those will also be incentivized. So you know, you basically will be able to set a fee for the snark work that you're doing. That will create a marketplace. Whoever is um, producing the next blocks gets to choose which um, snarks they include in that block. If they include your snark, um, then they have to pay you out whatever fee you, you claim that you would set. So those are the three ways um, basically nodes are incentivized. For, for the next question, the Linux and Raspberry Pi. Yeah, for it. Can I do it? Go ahead. So Raspberry Pi is an ARM-based uh, processor. We've never cross-compiled for ARM that I've tried, uh, but I'm very excited about the idea. Um, so I think I will give that a shot for you, Terry. Uh, the RAM footprint on there, I think it's four gigs in its max, so that might be a limiting factor. Um, but I, I will I will definitely give that a shot. And 32-bit? Uh, no, 64-bit ARM. Okay. Um, I, I've never actually built an OCaml build environment on Raspberry Pi, but I've had, I've had a few uh, interesting uh, approaches. Yeah. I, would, I would love to do that. And then one thing we could like explore later is when we just want to do validation, yes. that should be, you know, very, very easy to do on a Raspberry Pi. Like, definitely not even come close to resources. Yeah, yeah. so like at some point in, in, in the test network, we'll, oh, sorry. At some point, at some point, maybe not this test net, but like in the coming uh, weeks, we'll, we'll push, be pushing out like just a pure verifier node that uh, will be able to run in any, pretty much any resource environment. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Will staking be collateralized by a set amount, or is everyone a staker? That's a good question. Yeah. So Pablo, um, everyone is a staker. There's not like a threshold uh, amount that you need to collateralize. Um, and then, but if you don't want to like be a staker, like for example, there's going to be some requirements to watch the network. Um, and you know, we already mentioned there's some sort of like uh, you know storage requirements and compute requirements. Um, you can also delegate. So if if you just like want to be participating in the network and maybe more in a verification role, uh, but you have some stake, you can delegate to another staker. So we have mechanism to do that. These are great questions. Yeah, these are great questions. Does anybody else like every question is a good question? Is there anything that you're wondering um, that we can help you out with? But there are additional questions in the channel that are not showing oh, up on the screen. Oh, okay. Go ahead and read them out first. Brad might be able to see them, or I can read them. Uh, let me. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Okay, uh, here we go. Thank you all. Okay. Um, what the work that stakers do versus the work that start? Just repeat the question. Okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, this question is: Can you explain in more detail the work that stakers do versus the work that snarkers do, and why those roles are separated? Yeah, sure. So, so stakers are just proposing new blocks. So it's analogous to um, uh, like miners in Bitcoin, say. Um, they're they're basically selecting which transactions are going to be included in the next block. Um, the snarkers, on the other hand, are basically uh, producing proof. Once we, yeah, snarkers are producing proofs um, for transactions which have already been confirmed. Um, the reason it's separated is basically to decouple um, block production from uh, producing proofs. Um, mostly because of the fact that producing proofs takes some time. There's like some latency associated with it, um, and we wanted to make sure that that wasn't constraining the block time. Um, so that's pretty much why they're separated. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, Scarlett, that's a good point. That's true too. Okay. Um, someone's asking, what is your ideal application slash use case for Coda or long-term vision? I don't know. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Evan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think the like very long-term vision is a cryptocurrency that anyone in the world can access trustlessly from any device, whether it's like their phone or their browser, no matter whether they have a good internet connection or a bad internet connection. And also a platform that developers can build for really easily. I think like cryptocurrency as is today, there's like a humongous surface area of like a trillion different technologies if you want to just like get access to cryptocurrency. And at least my vision for it is having a cryptocurrency that's like as easy to like access as like any other library as like a Unix command that just like you just like get access to an interface that gives you access to like digital value so that it really can like bring technology as close to digital value as possible. Um, so that'll be all rolling out uh, as we go through the test and stuff. Um, somebody's asking if we're working on an SDK supporting smart contracts. Uh, yeah, I can answer that one. Um, initially, uh, this won't be available for the testnet, but this is like a, a great idea, and we know that a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies right now are working on adding smart contracts to the protocol. Uh, as we ramp up to mainnet and further on, this will be uh, an evolved.
well being part of the discussion. Um, and hopefully we can support some higher functionality more so than just sending transactions. So and, yeah. keep an eye out and yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I want to add, um, we, we won't have the smart contract support right now, but we will be building out an SDK um, where, uh, you know, we hope you all build some cool stuff. And, and we'll build some cool stuff as examples. <laughs> yeah. Nice. There are some other questions who wants to take which the roles, question. Yeah, which roles will need full state store access? Um, I believe that's just going to be uh, block producers or the stakers. Um, yeah. And I was going to add just like when we say full state, it just means just like the UTXO set. Yeah. No one has to store the full history if they don't want to. Yep. Yeah. Um, and if you're just like a verifier, you only need the little proof. Yep. So which roles will store just the recursive snark proof? That's just verifiers, but everyone will everyone will use it. I guess snarkers don't necessarily need to store the current recursive snark proof, but you know, it's only uh, like <laughs> kilobytes, so why not? Um, okay. Somebody asked Wasm. I, I don't really understand the question. Oh, yeah. Like, Wasm. When we when we choose a smart contract yeah. like language, will we use like Wasm? I think that's like um, TBD. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's TBD, but Scarlet, I agree. I'm really bullish about Wasm. I like the idea that anybody can choose whatever the language they want and develop applications on top. So yeah, this is definitely a topic. I agree. Um, Scarlett also asked another great question. What's the architecture design? Is it heading towards one blockchain infrastructure like current Ethereum, sharding, or sidechain architecture? So, so one yeah. blockchain. Yeah. And what's cool is that because like the snarks can verify like other snarks, um, you can get like really high scalability on like one chain because the one chain can like verify like a ton of transactions and still be super super small. Yeah. So you don't have like the same issues around like needing sharding or sidechain architecture like well, explicitly. In some, in some sense, there's always going to be some, some kind of sharding. Or, there's always some, like, yeah, there's some crazy, like, scaling, like, 10 billion TPS are needed, I guess. Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, uh, uh, at some point, not everyone can, can yeah, 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 yeah. all the state. At some point. Yeah. But uh, right now, we're mostly focusing on um, just building out the main, the main blockchain. Yeah. Cool. All right, awesome. Some Thanks. really good questions. Um, does anybody have anything else? Make sure that you chat it in. If, we, if you've chatted it in and we answered it, can you re-chat it um, just so we make sure we get you covered? Yeah. Uh, yeah, these are great questions, though. Yeah. Or ask in our Discord later. We'll be around. Check. Okay. Um, I've got a question. Are there any known applications on your blockchain? If not, is it planned to launch such applications in the near future? What will they be? Um, well, the blockchain doesn't really exist yet, so <laughs> no known applications. Uh, I mean, well, uh, we are developing like some applications internally. Um, yeah, that's going to be like another really fun part of the doing the testnet. So a testnet will provide a more realistic substrate on which people can start developing applications. So, um, you know, I don't want to spoil the uh, the phases too much, but one of the things that we're going to be focusing on is getting a lot of fun, yeah, exactly, fun applications spun up on it. And we'll be developing some, and we'll open source everything like we always do. Um, so, you know, if you have ideas or, and, and the fun thing about our applications um, is they're just going to be dramatically easier to develop than most other cryptocurrency applications because uh, you don't have to deal with solidity. You can just program them in whatever language you're most comfortable with. So, And I want to add, like, uh, you can just, like, build a browser application and just, like, build it that way. Your users won't have to, like, you know, go through a bajillion onboarding steps and download, like, a bunch of extensions and stuff. So it should be like easier to build something that people, real people can actually use also, yeah. which will be exciting. And, and we want to hear from you, so we'll expose our API and have an SDK and open it up to y'all to build something cool or something that maybe doesn't exist right now. Uh, one thing that's been top of mind for me is a, a block explorer. So once the GraphQL API is out, being able to visualize the code of blockchain is one really cool application that I'd love to see spun up soon. Um, anyone ask, someone asked if there's any limitation regarding the number of nodes. Um, that's another thing we're going to test. I mean, I think, like, theoretically, it's very hard to imagine a limitation regarding the number of nodes, but I'm sure practically we'll see, <laughs> we'll see, like, issues scaling the network past, like, tens of thousands of nodes, but I think that's something we are excited to test. Um, in, the, in the protocol, like, there shouldn't be any limitation as far as I'm aware, um, but... Yeah, I don't right think there. so. Yeah, I don't think there is. Just, like, how big can a gospel net be? Pretty right. big. Yeah. So... Um, okay, so we're at time, and I think like this is just the beginning of a conversation. So we invite you all to come over to Discord. Um, we'll be sharing this presentation, and as well as like the link on um, Twitter and YouTube, 
And so um, if you didn't get it down, just follow us on Twitter. We're um, Twitter backslash Coda Protocol, and you can um, figure out how to connect with us. But thank you all so much. I'll send the Discord in the chat. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Thanks, Brad. Yep. Um, yeah, thanks so much.